It's been a while since I've done anything like this. Um, I hate it when people say, um. The depth of our being is often unfathomed, left without navigational maps, left without sounding the depths. And uh, it's likely because we're not quiet enough. It's likely because we spend too much time identifying with the outer world. Um, although some would say that's a uh, false dichotomy that there really isn't an outer versus an inner, that this is all our mind, this glorious creation is our inner world as much as what we see when we close our eyes. Yet I have come to realize that there is a substrate of life. There is a field of pure consciousness, of pure potentiality and uh, probabilistic power, meaning we could revision our entire lives in every moment if we had access, conscious, tactile, sentient appreciation of the substrate that is life itself, that, it, that underpins life, that gives us the possibility of art, the possibility of poetry, the possibility of infinite forms in nature. That all comes not from pure material potency, but from a deeper underpinning of life. All this is just like the surface of our skin, which I imagine if we looked at closely enough, we would be astounded. But beneath that, dropping beneath the surface features, the appearances, that's, that's what we have to do if we really want to understand anything, if we really want to speak from a place of heart or a place of pure being, we have to understand without understanding, we have to know without knowing, we have to see without the grasping mind without the need for concrete form. Oh, there is a house, there is a hill, there is a cloud. Look, it's sunset now. These are very linear constructs. But in the noumenal plane of pure consciousness, in the world that is typically unseen, nothing is linear and nothing is concrete. Everything morphs into everything else, and it's like a scrying bowl. What we see behind our eyes, especially when we're getting ready to retire our linear brains for the day, what we see behind our eyes is the precursor dimension dimension that came first. When people say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's not the question. The 
question is, did consciousness precede the phenomenal world? Did consciousness precede those birds flying in the sky above me? Did consciousness precede the birth of stars? Did consciousness exist before any of this? Now that gets us to the question of time. What is time? People say time is a construct, but I say no. I say time is a real force in nature. But you see, time doesn't have a starting place. And therefore, consciousness cannot have had a starting place either if it precedes all of the things of the temporal world. Um, we talk about geologic time, we talk about sidereal time. We talk about time dilation, we talk about black holes, we talk about relativity. We, we don't really know how time and consciousness are wedded. <clears throat> but I think that's really where we have to get to in our science and in our studies of life is to realize that we are timeless beings because consciousness itself is timeless and for whatever reason we have elected or been elected <laughs> to temporalize our consciousness temporarily we are now living in time, uh, not eternal time as such, but in a subset of time. Our mortal bodies and the sensate beingness that this gives us, uh, that our bodies uh, gives us, uh, or give us, this is where we begin to perceive time in a limited fashion, although I think that's just conditioning. I think that's just very larval in its implications like yes it takes you x amount of time to get from a to b okay but does that mean that the future didn't already exist in other words we don't really know if time is linear if there is this thing that, that physicists call the arrow of entropic time. We don't really know whether time isn't flowing back upon us, meaning that the future is arriving in every moment and not that we are traveling from here to there, but that it is devolving upon us that we will experience the future invariably and inevitably because Time is actually flowing backward, not forward. The future already exists, perhaps, at least in potentia, and we are gaining access to it because the past is only a shadow of the future. But again, how are time and consciousness wed? And how do we grow more aware of 
the pure potentiality of our being in light of this? How do we silence the conditioned part of ourselves that would imprison us in a permanent temporal limitation. We're not we're not limited because we do not know what comes before death and we do not know what comes after, but recently I have been gaining access to wisdom that suggests we have voluntarily brought ourselves low in terms of our stepping out of eternal uh, out of the eternal continuum of timelessness and we've asked ourselves to endure a period of temporality because we want to remember we want to help others remember that nature is entirely dependent upon our understanding of time. And since nature in this quadrant of the galaxy is very much threatened, i.e. planet Earth, or at least appears to be threatened, we eternal beings have had to accept a sort of penalty, a sort of penance, which is to forget our eternal selves, to think that only God is eternal, to think that only the angels and servants of the Most High could ever be even possessed of eternal consciousness, but that's not at all the way I see things. When I close my eyes, I see infinity. The truth is, what you see behind your eyes is always there, even with your eyes open, but various subtle shapes, forms, influences, visions, <clears throat> Cosmic effluvia, flows of inspiration and insight will enter the third eye if you can spend enough time concentrating on your in the, on the middle of your brow while your eyes are closed. You will see your whole life flash before your eyes and you will also see that nothing is solid, that time is the great change agent, that we are being morphed and moved on that axis of time at the root level of our consciousness, of our being. So it isn't our job to return to a sense of our eternity while we're in a temporal state. It's our job to anchor eternal consciousness on a temporal axis. And that's extremely hard. If you were able to do that, you might not be concerned about death you might actually be able to live more fully than any other human who's ever lived. If you have that capacity to 
see yourself as an extension of all that is and yet also hold to the truth of your temporal self, which is certainly only a shard of the great magnanimous being that is life. You can only give so much. You can only influence so much. But you can love everything. You can revere and celebrate everything. Even paltry things. Even disappointing things. Even damnable things. For when we hate, or when we fight against the unity of our being, something happens to distance us from the eternal, from the anchoring of the eternal in our bodies. And now after talking for at least 15 minutes, I'm at this amazing paradoxical point where I recognize I have both said enough and that I'm only just beginning, beginning to get clear and establish a rhythm. And so self-doubt is a function of not ever having seen your reflection clearly because once you do, you can't lose the memory. Not fully lose touch with who you are in the eyes of heaven, for lack of a better word. Um, let it be known that the people and the planet are one. Let it be known that wisdom is not elusive, but it is certainly not limited. And therefore, you cannot turn true wisdom into a dogma. You cannot lord wisdom over another because wisdom is active. Wisdom is a verb. Wisdom is moving. It's not a noun. It's not a concrete thing. Wisdom is the feminine side of knowledge. In fact, it's juxtaposed to knowledge because knowledge makes you feel like your power over because you have command of the true name of something. But wisdom makes you a servant of the Most High. It makes you an anchor of eternity in time. And it doesn't take much to get there. In fact, that's why I believe peace is the most difficult path is because it takes no effort. It takes no knowledge and it takes no special disposition to be an embodiment of wisdom. You are it. It is you. It is not even an it. <laughs> it's what's behind all of this. You see all this worldly and material development out here that humans are all concerned with bringing to bear on the planet? I mean, look. Look at these cities. There's massive... Massive cities out there. I don't know if you can even see them. But why, why are we so preoccupied with that? You know, just to quote, or at least paraphrase, a rather controversial figure. The animals all know where they reside, okay? They have their holes and their nests. 
But we, who have realized that we are extensions of the eternal, that we who know that we know, we have no place. We have no place. So all this artifice is an attempt on the part of we poor homeless souls to make a place to rest our heads. But there is no place. You can make a home for yourself that has every conceivable amenity and still you may not know who you are. In this moment, I ask that the freedom of non-conceptual suchness be the anchor of my life. I ask that the rains of heaven come to slake my material thirsts so thoroughly that I would never seek to build one more artifice, one more industry, one more attempt at self-actualization. For I am all that is, and that is all I ever shall be. Self-actualization is important, but that doesn't mean you have to build an empire. That's all I'm saying. Power is not a function of how many people you're able to influence or how many great words you're able to speak or how many towers of Babel you can build. It is a function of knowing the call that brought you here. There might be a fifth dimensional you that stands outside of time right now and is patting you on the rump or on the back or on the head saying, you're good, you're good, you're good. And all is good and, and, and. There are no buts, there are no wherefores or how-tos when it comes to being. We are the whole universe. That's why I like to say we are not living in the universe. The universe is living in us and it's just right there. All you have to do is let go of the, the limitations of thought and of belief and of conditioning. And you can see right through all of the artifice. You could see through your own complicity with madness. You can grow beyond ambition, control, being right or wrong, politics, money, all of it. They can just fall away. And then instead of being a bubble-headed bliss ninny, you can be a hollow reed through which the clear music of that minstrel band which comes and plays from whence it comes and where it goes, no one knows, may play. You are, I am, and we shall ever be a hope.